Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Ford. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And this is Adrian Reads Harry Potter. I'm like, I can't even segue it anymore. I expect there's the hate comment, and that's where I say Adrian Reads Harry Potter. You just give me silence now. I, um, I'm giving you the silent treatment. It's fine. It's fine. I'm used to that. Yeah. Uh, this is Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, chapters 19 and chapters 20, Elf Tales and Lord Voldemort's Request. Uh, starting to get into a few more things here, studying the uh, pace for the ending of this novel and the beginning of the next. There's so, another one? There's another one. We're moving yeah. forward. Uh, I thought so, this was the last one. No, no, one more year. I mean, unless you want to like read Cursed Child after that. Like, we can continue forward. There's plenty of options. Harry Potter is always a thing. Actually, just the other day I was sitting at home, like I turned on the TV and Harry Potter was playing. I'm like, ah, shit. Guess I'll watch Harry Potter. Really? Yeah. You decided to waste an evening watching yes, Harry I Potter. Yes, I did. It was wonderful. But anyway, let's break down these chapters a little bit. We have chapter 19, Elf Tales. Uh, Ron is in the hospital wing from the poison. We find out he was poisoned in Slughorn's office. Uh, Harry gets injured again during a Quidditch match, because Quidditch is apparently a bad thing for wizards. Uh, and he implores Creature and Dobby to, ch uh, to trail the disappearing Draco, trying to figure out where he's going. Uh, and then finally, chapter 20, Lord Voldemort's Request. We explore two memories with Dumbledore. Uh, the first is in the house of the elf Hokey. I believe that's how it's pronounced. I don't know. We'll go with that. Uh, he was wrongfully convicted of murdering his master uh, after uh, the master shows two relics to Dumbledore. Uh, relics from Hogwarts history. So we're going to get back into that. That seems to be a reoccurring theme. And the second is when Dumbledore refused Lord Voldemort the Defense Against the Dark Arts position at Hogwarts. Right. Uh, setting the pace of the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher every month. The curse of the Great Bambino. I, did, I, or did, did I not say that it was cursed? You did. I think you told me it wasn't. Did I? I think so. I don't think so. I think that's what you did. That's a, a thing. It's always been a thing, but now we just know why it's been a thing. It came to be when he was refused the position to teach there. And I think there's some interesting stuff we could get into on that. Um, about whether Dumbledore's decision was right, whether it was wrong, how it would have changed the pace of things. Well, I'm, I'm certainly interested in your... Well, go into that. Go ahead. Do you want to start with that? Sure. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Dumbledore refused the position of Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher to Voldemort. Uh, and this was in uh, when Voldemort was just first coming into power. Uh, the Death Eaters had just become a thing. He had... Uh, it, Obviously, he had done some terrible things up to that point, but he wasn't... He was rumored to have done some terrible Rumored to have done some terrible things, but not convicted, never tried. Uh, but Dumbledore shut him out and, you know, used his wisdom to say, you know, you're a terrible person, I'm not giving you this job. However, what better qualified person would you have for that job? And if Dumbledore had done that, well, let's be honest here, if Dumbledore had given him the job, would it have changed the pace of things? Given the man an opportunity. In fairness, it is a defense against the dark arts position, not a go ahead and relish in the dark arts position, right? Okay. Um, I am interested to know <laughs> why and how you are uh, cheerleading for Moldavort to get a position teaching kids. Well, I at don't, this don't, point don't get me wrong. I'm I'm normally the guy. I normally. I'd be the one making such a preposterous proposition. I try, I try. Uh, well, at this point, Voldemort had been rumored to do terrible things. Right. Uh, he had not become the full-fledged bad guy that everybody knows. Uh, so at this point, you have a man who is, well, first of all, he was one of your greatest students you ever had. Always did well in school. Uh, come back. Great option to teach your classes here. Obviously, he's skilled in the dark arts. He was in school. He has a passion for the dark arts, obviously. Uh, at what point did Dumbledore just uh, have this idea saying, eh, no, no. Well, what I want to know about this situation is at what point did they decide that the dark arts were dark? Okay. Right, and not just more arts. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, well, I, I would assume... Because what what's the stuff that they're studying in Defense Against the Dark Arts? How to defend themselves against attacks from wizards, things like that. Um, Do you have to use dark arts to attack another wizard? I, I think they are considered dark arts if you're using them maliciously so to it's the inflict. Intent. Yes, it, it'd be like a law enforcement class. You're not going to call it criminal intent. Learn how to be a criminal, but in that law enforcement class, you're still going to learn how criminals do this and you know how to take these procedures to evade such activity and how to combat that. That's right, about the best but, analogy I can but, make. But 
therein, the acts done by criminals are inherently at least illegal. Okay. Right? So is it illegal to attack another wizard? Um, I would say, I, I would assume yes. That's why we have Aurors, who are basically the law enforcement of the wizarding world. You do have the three curses that are considered, uh, they're not allowed magic, illegal basically. Uh, and I would assume that attacking another wizard would have the same or similar ramifications as it would attacking another person. Um, so basically, Defense Against the Dark Arts would be but, an exploration into that and possibly a little bit of self-defense. So is, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with the mechanism of dark. Um, not that this text necessarily requires that deep dive, but it becomes dark when the intent is such to hurt another wizard. Why are they not just, so are they just learning defense against magic in a class? Uh, essentially, yes. I mean, you're getting an, uh, an exposure to what these spells are. Uh, and you are learning how to defend yourself and others from such magic. So would or would not an, a, a former or current Auror be the best person to have for that position? I would say yes. Uh, and we did have that chance, although it wasn't actually Mad-Eye Moody. Uh, Mad-Eye Moody was hired in that light of, you know, this is a former Auror, one of the greatest of all times. He would be great at that position. Uh, you have Remus Lupin who was added in, who is someone who is not by profession an Auror. However, he is part of the Order of the Phoenix, which Dumbledore would have been aware of at that time. So someone who would be trained in this skill, for sure. Gilderoy Ooh. Lockhart. Diddledore didn't create the Order of the Phoenix? Did he? I, I, that's, I missed that book. I haven't read that book in years. I wasn't oh, I, I, I thought that it was a new thing. I didn't know that it was an ancient... Well, that, he would have been part of that group of people who are, you know, in this organization and, you know, moving forward. So, like... A, I so could by understand the time we're that. These books, yeah. Lupin would have been. Okay. Uh, Gilderoy Lockhart was allegedly one of the greatest, you know, defensive wizards of all the time of all times. He combated all these people, although it was fabricated, of course. So I, I would assume that the people that we are hiring for this position have skill and have quality. Or the rumor thereof. Or the rumor thereof, you know. Sometimes you get in a little over your head, put down on the application, you get a little fabrication, that's fine. Uh, but I, I would say if we have someone here who is extremely talented in this category, who has proven himself uh, when he was in school there to be talented in this category, who is... I, I was rumored to have killed a lot of people. You know, just give him the teaching post. Why not? Maybe yeah. turn him around. Yeah. Give him a fresh start. Give him an outlet. Uh, I, I don't know. That would have highly trained, like changed the pace of this novel here. And obviously it's just a weak plot point to be like, oh, Dumbledore said no, you can't do that. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know. I, you would assume Dumbledore had the wisdom to say no, yeah. but it, it really just reads as in, he's like, well, no. To be honest, I had always assumed that he had been uh, a professor. Okay. Um, because it just sort of, it makes a better story because it makes you, you were forced then to at least consider what would have happened with Moldevort walking the halls of, of Mogwarts, um, just face to face with all these other people for how long? Okay. And then how would he have gotten out of that situation? I, I just think it would have been stronger. Okay. Uh, as opposed to just the, you know, no, piss okay. off. Well, we have uh, Snape is the current Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, obviously, in this yeah. novel here. Uh, and this is a man whose passion has always lied in the dark arts and the Defense Against the Dark Arts. Well. If his passion lies in the dark arts, how is he not a criminal? Uh, he is... I, I, <laughs> Do you see why I'm struggling with this now? It's fair. It's fair. Uh, criminal intent in the wizarding world, I guess, is a kind of a gray category here. Um, this is a man, you know, Dumbledore trusts, and I assume Dumbledore's trust for some reason will override anything. Uh, if he says, you know, I'm going to give you a job here, it'll work fine. I'd be... Along the lights of, let's say, somebody was convicted at one point in his life for doing something. Uh, although he is a felon, he can still go to school. He can get an education. If he shows the quality, he can still teach. Absolutely. I don't think felons could... I don't think it could... There's a bunch of things I don't think convicted felons can do. Felons can absolutely get an education. They absolutely can go to a university-level setting. They can be professors? Absolutely. I don't know if that's true. 100% guarantee it. 
How many how many felon professors? I do don't you know have? any felon professors, but I, as someone who has worked with felons for a long time, I know for a fact they get an education, and it is considered discriminatory if you say you know we, we're not hiring any felons. Now you can have certain layers to that, like you know we're going to hire people for these particular crimes because absolutely not. What might those particular? I mean, crimes you kill be? somebody. Well, well. Uh, but we this, this is a different world. This is the wizarding world. Uh, but it is an interesting scene there. It seems like Dumbledore has set the pace for events to come uh, based purely on just his judgment. So we could say this this is all really just Dumbledore's fault. He's just cleaning up his mess at this point. I don't know that you can. No. I don't know that you can. Okay. Uh, so what else would you like to talk about in these two chapters here? Anything that's just uh, in the back of your mind? I've only got one real note. Okay. Um, Hagrid has the quote... It's terrible, all this new security, and kids are still getting hurt. Um, and that feels a lot like the War on Terror. Okay. Do you, I mean, do you remember the, the days post 9-11? I do. Um, a whole lot more uh, security everywhere you went. Absolutely. Everyone was sort of freaking out, but things still happened. Mm -hmm. So th that's just another parallel for me with these novels of it's a post 9-11 text. Okay. Um, it feels I don't even, I don't even know when the series was written. We're still having that issue today. Although security seems to be heightened everywhere. Yeah, I mean a lot of schools, even in this area, you have to wear a clear backpack. You have to have an ID badge at all times. You go through a metal detector. Yeah, uh, terrible things are still happening though. It's not preventing these. Yeah, and it, it th this feels a lot like so. In the days following nine eleven, there was like I say this big freakout and new security everywhere. Mm -hmm. And when people still did terrible things, there was this feeling like, how had we been so vulnerable for so long and just never noticed it? Okay. And this this feels, this text feels a lot like that, right? With okay. all of these, um, so the, the, the attacks, the, the poisoning and the necklace thing, they feel a lot like um, a suicide bomber. Okay. Don't they? Because it's an attack that comes out of nowhere, um, is sort of directed, but s sort of not. Like, there's not a great deal of precision going into these things, right? Okay. Which gives it a feel, a feel like uh, of something like a, a suicide bomber, because you're just running into a place and hoping you kill people, right? All right. Um, now, with these two particular attacks, both the poisoning and the necklace. Um, it, do we have any notions about what's going on with that there, where these are coming from, what the intent is? Uh, because it seems like both time, both times now, uh, the intent, intent was not executed properly. Right. Uh, somebody else became the fodder in the way of the actual attack. So any ideas, any notions where that's going, where that's coming from? It leads me to believe that it is not Moldavort, that it okay. is either Drago or... Um, oh, what was her name? The... The cousin of Harry's godfather. Bellatrix? Bellatrix, Okay. Yeah. So either Draco or Bellatrix is doing this. Yeah. It uh, seems to me. Okay. I, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems not more a direct attack. It is kind of like sulking in the shadows there and like we're just going to you know, try to slide this in here and hopefully it gets to its destination. Uh, and we could assume at this point that the target would be Dumbledore. Uh, the potion was allegedly meant for Dumbledore. The necklace was to be delivered to. Uh, it, it's, it was to be delivered to Dumbledore? Yes. So, okay. Yes. Uh, so it, it seems like Dumbledore is being targeted here. We just don't know by who, and we don't know the exact reason why. Uh, but it, it does seem a little suspicious, and we are going to start getting into that a little bit more. Uh, but speaking of cursed objects and objects in general, we've talked a lot about Dumbledore's fascination with relics. Uh, items of power, fancy, pretty baubles, things like that. Uh, we get this cutback scene here where he gets... Dumbledore or Moldavort? Voldemort. Okay. Uh, because, well... Dumbledore by proxy through Voldemort okay. because we're trying to, you know, break down what's going on with Voldemort here. Uh, but we do get this flashback scene where this woman is murdered for two of her antiques, both of which being two items held by the Hogwarts founders. Yeah. So any idea what, what that is, what we can uh, piece together through out of that? Is there some type of prime founding power that has been put into uh, relics? So that he would still need something from the Gryffindor house and something from the Hufflepuff? Hufflepuff. 
Um, not necessarily, no. Uh, once we get into, you know, fantasy fiction, things like that, this genre, uh, items such that have always held power. You know, you have the crown of the king or something, the sword of the king. Uh, they always seem to have some kind of prestige behind them. So there, there is an air of prestige to that there. So maybe this is just, you know, Voldemort wanting to, you know, throw his weight around. Um, well, I, I don't know. So that, that does not seem like a character that is particularly into collectibles. Okay. So, I, I, like, that's the thing that gets me about this so far is that it seems there must be something more going on with magic. And if there's not, then it's just sort of poorly written. Okay. Um, the endowment of these relics with power. From whence does that come? How was that executed? How is it held in the relic? Does someone have to be, is it like a, I don't know, like when you establish a, a scholarship, you, a lot of places you can donate $10,000 to the school and then there's a scholarship in your yeah. name. You know what I mean? So is it something like that? You have to exert a certain amount of magic into a relic and then there's a certain amount that can come out. It'll pay out. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said, it is a trope of this genre of literature and like that is... Uh, someone who would be a fan of fantasy literature would be just very much comfortable with that would idea. Would be very accepting. Yeah, absolutely but, so. But I, I'm not sure that that uh, it's means the, it's good. It's the same idea with, you know, Dumbledore because he is old. He is therefore powerful. He's experienced more. He's been around. Ancient magical objects always have power to them. Uh, that is going to be a big thing going forward. Uh, so try to keep that in mind. Uh, there are going to be certain objects in the wizarding universe, wizarding world, whatever you want to call it, that are considered, like, top of the line. There is no better. There is no more powerful. Uh, and only one exists. So. Only one exists. Oh, okay. Yeah, only I one know. object exists. It's unique to this world. And because it's unique to this world, it's ancient, it is powerful. Okay. Uh, magic that perhaps has been forgotten or just imbues the user with more skill. So. A little interesting there. That is something to definitely keep in mind, though, especially since it seems that not only was Voldemort trying to collect items like this, but now it seems that Dumbledore is very interested in these items he was collecting. Okay. Okay. Nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? I, well, I, I, I asked my questions. It just doesn't seem... Like, it okay. just... It's, um... It is not fulfilling as okay. an idea set. That these things just have power to have power. Okay. Right? Uh, well, we read Lord of the Rings. Look at that. There was the one ring that was created to have power. But it was uh, endowed with that Exactly. Power. It was endowed with that power. There were rings that were endowed with power. Um, even and by the way, I am not uh, a cheerleader for Lord of the Rings. I thought you loved it. I thought that's what we were doing in September. No, you want to just not. carry on with that. No, it is not. Okay. Uh, but there are items of power, and that, that's always been a thing, especially in this magic community, anything you want to call a magic community. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Slughorn, because Slughorn, is, Slughorn still seems to be, you know, circling around all of this. Uh, we get a little bit of talk how, basically, you know, he's been in hiding. And it would seem that Voldemort was very close to Slughorn. We even get a mention that, you know, they were like, it was his favorite student, basically, his favorite professor. Uh, how do you think that is affecting this novel as of now? Because we could see that you know Slughorn is obviously hiding something. Uh, just what we don't know yet. The whole idea of him fogging his own memory. Yeah. Uh, so why do you think he is currently hiding from Voldemort? Uh, any idea what he could have done to catch Voldemort's eye? Anything along those lines? Well, I would imagine. Well, I would imagine that it is connections and that he has some type of. Uh, relic that Voldemort okay. would, would treasure or prize or want. Okay. Um, it does not seem that he is particularly talented himself. Uh, ah. He seems to be on the run, like w the way we found him. Um, it is certainly it is certainly telling that uh, Diddledore wants him there. Yes. Despite the fact that... Uh, well, it seems like he's guarding him. Okay. Uh, it seems, seems like he's guarding slug, slug Thing because he knew all of the bad things that came with him. 
Okay. And he got him back on campus anyway. Okay. I don't think it's fair to say that Slughorn is not particularly powerful. He seems to be one of the best in his field of potions. Uh, so much so that, I mean, the long-running potions professor at Hogwarts was immediately just schluffed out to make room for Slughorn to come back. So, you know, Snape, why don't you go to you know, teach your defense against the Dark Arts? We don't need you now. We got this guy. Uh, he is a very skilled potions master. Okay. So, I mean, give him... It, it does. He does seem a bit aloof as a teacher. He does. He does. Um, it seems like he is there for the practice of gaining people. Yes. It, that's his thing. Uh, it, that eccentric old professor that everyone always has, you know. He's just batshit crazy. He does his own thing. But when you sit down, the man knows his shit. Yeah. He's just in his own little world. So is, so is potions magic? Yes, potions is magic. It is the creation of a tonic or some kind of elixir, something like that, that has magical properties. It can cure, it can harm. But is it or is, is it not just the application of ingredients? I, for the most part, yes. So a non-magic person could make a magical tonic? I would assume yes. So is he really all that talented when they could bring somebody in off the street to read the instructions? Okay. Uh, well, I think there's more than just reading the instructions. I mean, let's look at somebody who can bake very well. I can read instructions and bake something, but if you sit me down and say, I need you to bake this, I want it to taste like that, now I'm screwed. Yeah. So, I think there's a little bit of a kind of a scientific method to that, a little trial and error with things like that, so you kind of get that... Yeah, practice. That gray line between, you know, science and magic and practice and skill. No, uh, there's no, there's no gray line between practice and magic. Okay. Uh, especially... There... People do not seem to be able to do magic if they are not magical individuals. Okay. If they are not magicians. Okay. And we do actually get a very interesting scene where I believe Hagrid calls uh, Filch uh, a filthy squib or something like yeah, that. Yeah. That was that was pretty troubling for an inclusive text. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you're not magical folk, if you aren't born into this magic, yeah. I guess you're just a filthy squib. I figured you'd, uh, you'd have some comments about that there. It was well, kind of an uncomfortable I, I'm scene. I'm trying to get away from all that. Okay. Because... It, Honestly, we're doing this two chapters at a time. There's always something I can pick on in that fashion. Very fair. And, and that's two chapters at a time. And then I just get pissy. And then it's just the whole episode is derailed because it's just me complaining about um, basically social justice warrior tropes that are not in Harry Potter that J.K. Rowling then says other people are bad people for not including and she gets a free pass because she is the mother of social justice warriors. Okay. Like I, I don't, and it's just it's not it's not conducive to talk about the literature. It's not conducive to um, the ideas at play. Just just the stupidity involved in someone being a J.K. Rowling. Okay. Uh, well, one last thing we should probably mention here before we wrap up this week's episode. Uh, there was talk of an argument between Snape and Dumbledore. I was a little bit overheard by Hagrid, but he didn't want to comment on it. It was, you know, private business. Uh, any idea where that's coming from? What's going on between those two? He does not, I think it's that he does not want to play like he is a, uh, a Death Eater anymore. Okay. Uh, that, and that's how, that's how it would come across. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure, but... Okay, so you're trying to say, like, Snape's just trying to get out, clean break? Mm, out from what? Just wants to do his job, doesn't want to have to play the both sides anymore? I would say that he is uncomfortable being that close to those people again. Okay. Uh, it's, it strikes me as it might be sort of like a, a relapse situation. Okay. People that stop drinking don't want to be around alcohol. The minute someone starts drinking, they've got to leave. This is fair. Um, this and is the first time that that side of things is coming back to power. Yeah. As you could say with your analogy, I mean, the party's starting, so it, yeah. it's time to go. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I can understand that for sure. That's how it seems. I, I again, like there's 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 certain things I'm not sure how to take a read. So when you're taking a read on literature, not just reading the literature, you're taking a read of the things to see if they have predictive power. Um, you're you're judging a lot of the human elements involved, and a lot of the human elements involved in this are counterintuitive because it's just. It is poorly written. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make excuses. It's poorly written. The the people aren't real half the time. Um, rules come and go. Tropes matter or they don't matter or they're counterintuitive. So it, it it's. I'm getting to the point where I'm not sure how much 
forecasting is even necessary, despite the fact that there's, I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be, what, 4,000 pages of this stuff? Uh, yeah, at least. Yeah. These so. are about six, 700 pages each. So, I mean, there's, there's 35 books in the series, so. It is quite a text. Yeah. Uh, but we will be back next week with a couple more chapters of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Adrian reads Harry Potter. We're going to be talking about chapters 21, 22, The Unknowable Room, and After the Burial. Uh, we're going to hopefully crack a few more things, get this ball rolling. Um, I, I, there's some interesting stuff that's going to be happening here, and I, I am excited to actually hear your take on that. Uh, things that are going to completely change the pace for the next novel. Because the next novel is very different than this one. Really? Very different. Um, is and there I, still school involved? Yes. Yeah. I don't want to talk much more about that because that could lead to ruining some things, but it is a very different read. Okay. Uh, so hopefully maybe that's a better thing. Or yeah. maybe it's worse. I don't know. Maybe we'll be like, eh, we'll those first six guess, books huh? weren't bad. <laughs> those first three years weren't bad, but this last one is rough. <laughs> I've been reading this for my entire adult life, it feels like. You're so happy about it. But we will be back next week with more Adrian Reed's Harry Potter. And if you like this kind of thing, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. We release these every single week every until we are week. done with the series. You're until excited about it. Make sure you give this video a like as well. We always appreciate a like. And if you are so inclined, there is a link, as always, to our Patreon in the description below. Should we go back to reading three chapters? I feel like you get more meat out of it. I don't know.